So that's what I'm trying to find out. Right. And I've done that a couple of different ways. I've tried to do um, the uh, M1 V01 plus M2 V02 equals M2 VF2 plus M1 VF1. Um, I tried that oh. and I got a number that didn't work. Okay. And and then I tried um, M1 V01 plus M2 V02 equals parentheses M1 plus M2 uh, VF. Yes, that sounds like the one you want to do. That didn't work either. Okay, well let's let's write it out and see how it goes. Okay. Uh, so with all collisions, whether they're um, elastic or inelastic, you, you have to start out with conservation of momentum. Right. And so uh, what that means is the momentum, everything that's moving in the first situation has to equal everything that's moving in the second situation. Yeah. Is the truck moving also in the first situation? Yeah, it was. So that both the car and the truck are moving? Yeah. Okay, so you've got mass of car times the speed of the car plus the mass of the truck times the speed of the truck. These two combined give you the momentum in the initial situation. Right. Okay, then after the collision, the two vehicles stick together and so yeah. it's like it's one chunk. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. And so in the final situation, you're going to have mass of car plus mass of truck stuck together. Right. And that gives you a final speed. And so I think you know everything here except that. Yeah, and I tried to do, um, do you want to see my, uh, my math? Um, let me let me just see if I can write down the numbers and see if you wrote down the same numbers here. Yeah. Let's see. Got a car. One 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 five. And the speed of the car is twenty five. And these are all proper units to start with, so no conversions. And you got a truck, eighty eight hundred. What does that last V say? Because I can't see it. This one? Or that no. One? This yes. One? That's an F. Okay. VF as in final. Okay. Sorry. Just let me know if my handwriting gets too sloppy. Oh, no. It just gets kind of blurry. Like oh, yeah. That happens sometimes. It's, a, uh, uh, you know, computers. Yeah. 20. Okay. So this will be 115. And this will be... Okay, Amy, are these the numbers that you plugged in? Uh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. I see the number you wrote down, and it's it's not right. Let me let me plug them in myself here. Divided by one 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 five plus eight hundred. Yeah, I got the same thing you got. Twenty point five six. Uh, yes. Okay, and let then me read the question again to make sure that we're not doing something silly here. We got a car traveling initially with a speed of 25 in the easterly direction crashes into the rear end of a truck moving in the same direction, so they're both positive. That's good, okay. The velocity of the car right after the collision, oh, they don't stick together. The velocity of the car right after the collision is 18. Okay, they yeah, don't to stick to together. Yeah, I tried that didn't work either. Okay, well, let's write that one out. Okay, so I, I wrote this without reading the question completely, assuming that the cars stick together. That was a bad assumption. They don't stick together. The moral of the story is always read the question. Uh, so let's try this again. 
momentum in the final situation is going to be still two separate vehicles. So you're going to have mass of car times the final speed of the car plus mass of truck times final speed of the truck. Chelsea, can you read those? Yeah. Okay. So then the numbers that we plug in here, the problem tells us, and we're using Amy's numbers here, but you all have your own numbers. You can look them up. Uh, Amy's number, this one is 18 here, and this is still 8,800. And it's this one that we're solving for. And Amy, you already tried this one too? Yeah, I did, but I'm redoing it just this. Okay, let's, let me double check these numbers as well. Okay, so let's see. Yes, now I get the correct answer. Moral of the story, read the question. I'm almost done. Okay, you're all right. Yeah, I got 20.89, is that what you got? Yep. Yeah, I guess I must have done something wrong with the um, kinetic energy equation. Okay. Oh, okay, so does this all make sense why this is what it is? Yeah, yeah. Why this one is initial momentum and this one is final momentum? Yeah. Okay. Um, how are you going to do part B? Um, it's a change of kinetic energy, so it's the... Not, not, not quite. What? And not quite. It says how much mechanical energy is lost, which you're right. For this problem is only kinetic, but mechanical right. energy implies kinetic and potential. So okay. If they were going up a hill, you'd have to take that into account as well. But it's flat, so you don't have to worry about anything but kinetic. So yeah. What what you said is correct, but I I was just double checking. You understood the difference there. Right, yeah. Okay, so go ahead and try it again. So for kinetic energy initial, I did 1 half 115 25 squared plus 1 half 8820 squared. That's because that's the two uh, kinetic energies, right? Yes. So you're going to use both of these, but yeah. in, the mechanic, in the kinetic energy equation. Mm -hmm. And so I did the same thing with, um, I did the same equation with the uh, final. Mm hmm. Yep. And um, and then I subtract the final from the the the, uh, the initial from the final, and um, I got a other way around. You're gonna have more to start with than you do at the end. So uh, initial minus final. Initial minus final. Okay, so let me just do that real quick. So because it's looking for how much is lost. So yeah, I'm gonna have like do, one more try left on this question, which is no big deal because I have like a 96 on the problem, on the, on the homework. But yeah, if you do final minus initial, that's fine. It'll just be a negative number, but that just means that it was lost, which is what you're um, you're trying to figure out. Uh, I got negative 7682. So that'd be negative 7700. You think? No, that's not gonna work. Let's That's see. it, and it's final. Hey, Jess. Hey. Uh, we're working on problem seven, chapter six. The, the um, one where the car runs into the U-Haul truck. Oh, OK, I can go back to that. Uh, so for part B, I think you said it right, Amy, but I'm just going to write it up here anyway. Uh, to find the initial kinetic energy, kinetic energy initial, we're going to do one half mass of car times the speed of the car squared plus one half mass of truck times speed of truck squared 
and then we're going to subtract off the kinetic energy final. Okay, so all this is kinetic energy initial. We're going to subtract off the same equation, but the final speed. So it's going to be one half mass car final velocity car squared plus one half mass truck final velocity of truck squared. Is that what you typed in, Amy? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. I just, um, when I subtracted the, the, the final minus initial or the initial minus final, um. Did you put parentheses around these? Like add these together and then subtract? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's final minus initial then? Uh, it's, it's initial minus final. Yeah, and I got 7862. I got 7682. That's not quite right. <clears throat> let me type in my, let me type in the numbers and see if it was just a, a button pushing error here. And I put, I try, I put both positive and negative forms of that into, um, website and both, it said both of them were wrong. Okay. Okay, so for your initial kinetic energy, I got, what did you get for your initial? 21.8437.5. Is that what you got? Yeah. For the initial? Okay, we're going to subtract off the same equation, but for final. car was going 18 and the truck is going 20.8869. And what'd you get for this one? For final, um, 21, 2100755. Okay, I got a different number for that. So, okay. The car's final speed was 18. And the truck's final speed was 20.8869. Yeah, that's, I did 20.89, but you know, okay. similar. Okay, 22.10019 times 10 to the six. Yeah. Is that the same number you got for your final? Yeah, it is. Okay. So then you subtract these. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, I got 21, uh, 2100755. Yeah, I think you got different numbers here. I put I an 18 it. here and a 20.8869 there. Yeah. I mean, I, I did 20.89. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference. It might not make any difference in the end. Let's see, especially since WebAssign only cares about three sig figs. Yeah. Yeah, I get the right answer when I use those numbers. Okay, hang on, let me do that real quick. Okay. Uh, Jess, just so you know, uh, Darius is here in the room. You can't see him on the computer, but he's sitting behind the computer here. So. Okay. Uh, and actually, Darius was here first. So, uh, while Amy's punching those buttons, Darius, do you have any questions that we that you want to go through? Or do you want to? I mean, you don't have to have one if you don't want to. It's just I was just asking. I'm uh, fine right now. You're good. Okay. Okay. It's still wrong, but. I used up all my chance. Now I don't have any more chances what'd you, left. What'd you get? Um, I put exactly, I put um, 78.10. Why'd you get 78? 
When I subtract this number from this yeah. number. Yeah, that's what I did. I get, I get a different number. I get 8252.1. I don't know. I can't fix it now, so. Ah. Okay. Well, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. I, I think it's just a, a, um, a button pushing thing. I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's a rounding thing. Yeah, maybe. Um, in general, you don't want to round until after you get the final answer. So, yeah. So don't round anything off anywhere until you're here. So, if you, okay. so web assign is looking for three sig figs, so uh, it's looking for eight two five zero. So it's just the first three sig figs. Okay. Chelsea. Yes. You're next. What questions do you have? I don't really have it on web assign. It's like do with like the list that I just went over okay. on like chapter five. Okay. What questions? What do you, what do you have? Okay. So. For the um, second example for chapter five, it was the one with the slide. Okay, was that the girl sliding down the slide, getting launched yeah. into the pool? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I tried to do all the math, but I kept getting the wrong answer. Uh -oh. For the, the, which one? The, we had to figure out the V, I think L. The launch velocity. Yes. Okay, so for that one, you want to use, <clears throat> can I erase this? Amy, are you good with this one? Okay, I'm good, yeah, yeah. As I recall on that one, I think that the um, the numbers are correct on the video. Uh, you've got the girl at the top of the slide. She goes down the slide and launches right here. She, she starts out at the top and ends up here, except here she's moving. And we're asked for this launch speed here. Is that what the one part you're asking about, Chelsea? Mm -hmm. So. You use the work energy theorem and you say the energy initial equals the energy final minus the work not conserved. And because this is a water slide, there's no friction here, so we can throw this away. Now, in reality, there is some friction there, but it's not much, so we're going to call it zero. And uh, so to start with, we'll, we'll start out up here at the beginning, up here at the top, so the potential energy at the top. And then at the bottom, you've got two kinds of energy because she's off the ground and she's moving. So you're going to use potential energy and kinetic energy. So this will be MGH, that's this height here. And this height here, from here to here, that's H over 5, as my memory says. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the initial energy here at that point up there. And then in the final situation over here, she's not far as, as far off the ground, so it's mg h over 5 plus 1 half mv squared. And that speed there will be the launch speed. I'm um, Dr. Rick, I'm going to interrupt, but uh, I'm going to go since I'm done with chapter 6 already. Oh, okay. 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 Well, Bye. See, see you later. later. Have a good one. You too. Uh, so we're going to divide everything by m, and that goes away. And then we could subtract this piece to the other side. So we have a gh minus a gh over 5 equals a 1 half oops, v launch squared. 
Am I getting close to the part where you're seeing a mistake? Okay. Yeah. Uh, these two can be combined. Remember how to do this? This is the tricky math part. This one, you gotta have common denominators here. So yeah. what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this, a, multiply this by a five over five. So we have five fifths minus one fifth. So that's gonna give us four fifths GH equals one half VL squared. Now we can multiply both sides by two. And that'll cancel out the square over here. It'll turn that four into an eight. So we're gonna have eight fifths GH equals V launch squared. And then this is the last easy part. How do we get rid of the square? Square root. Yep. So now we just square root both sides. Okay. And that's all you gotta do. Does that does that make sense, Chelsea? Mm-hmm. Is that what the video did? No, it told us to do the math on our own, so I tried it and then ah, I Ah, okay. Okay. Did you end up with something that looks like this? At the beginning, no. Okay. Was it just an algebra mistake along the way? Mm -hmm. Was it right here? Yeah. That's the tricky spot. You just got to remember when you're subtracting fractions, you got to have common denominators. Okay. Sounds good. You squared away for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Jess, your turn. What questions do you have? I only have two. One's from chapter six and then one's from chapter seven. Okay. Um, for chapter six, uh, I, I just want to make sure. Okay, yeah. Um, so number eleven about the, like the. I don't know. It's like a platform with two masses. Um. Oh yeah, so, so it's like this ramp thing, with yeah, one mass up top so, and one mass below. Uh huh. Okay. So I got like half of part A. I got V two because I had to do like all of the substitution and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but <laughs> for some reason, I kept getting V1 wrong every time I tried to plug in V2 into the other equation. So I used up all of my chances or whatever, but okay. we'll have so, to use uh, yep. I'm looking at your answers here, and mm -hmm. it gave you credit for your V2 Yes. But you were wrong a little bit. On my V1, yeah. No, on your V2. Oh, okay. So your V2 was correct enough that WebAssign just said, oh, green check. But it mm -hmm. wasn't really all the way correct. So my okay. guess is there was a little bit of error there um, that then carried over to your V1 and made V1 too far away for it to count. Okay. So uh, we should probably double check that and see how you got your V2. Okay. Uh, so let me read the question because that got me in trouble last time. Uh, a block of M1 is released from a frictionless track of height, top of the table, it collides in elastic, it collides, collides elastically. And what does elastic mean? Elastic means kinetic energy is conserved. Correct, yes. And, and they, they Hit and stick or hit and bounce? Hit and stick? Nope. Hit and bounce, oh nope. no. Elastic means uh, bouncy. Uh, okay. In inelastic means not bouncy. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, and it says they collide elastically and tells you the mass of the second object, and then um, it wants all this information. Okay, so. Determine the velocities of the two objects just after the collisions. Okay, so let me erase this one. Chelsea, are you good with this? Can I erase this now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I. Uh, okay. M1 starts up here, and your M2 is down here. Is that 
right, two is at the bottom? Um, say that again. Is M2 at the bottom or at the top? M2 is at the bottom. Okay. Um, now for this initial part, we're gonna use for the slide, now this one and problem 12 are, are this kind of multi-step problem. So mm -hmm. the first step is the slide. So M1 slides down the hill, okay? For that part, to figure out the speed of M1 just before the collision, you have to use uh, work energy theorem. So you have to do okay. energy initial equals energy final minus the work not conserved. And I think it tells you that the track is frictionless, is that correct? Um, yes. Okay, so since the track is frictionless, there is no work not conserved. Yes. So initially is up here, it's potential energy, and we'll just make this the ground, so H is just this, this much. Okay. Okay. And then uh, in the final situation, it's now on the ground and moving, right? So in the final situation, we have one half mv squared. Mm -hmm. And this is all mass one, because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that's moving here. And so that mass is going to cancel out because it's on both sides. Mm -hmm. And we can solve for this final speed. So yes. that speed is going to be a uh, square root of 2 times g times h. Yes. OK? I can put it in line. Okay. And I'm going to call that vf, because that's the final speed of the slide. Uh-huh. OK, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now that's step one of this problem. There's, this is a multi-step problem. So the next step is the two objects now crash into each other. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a collision. Okay, so that's step one. Now step two is, this is step one. Now step two, now you've got a collision. And for the collision, the final speed of M1 becomes the initial speed of M1 for the collision. Does that make sense? You say that one more time, I'm sorry. The final speed of M1 for the slide is the initial speed for the collision. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> what we're gonna, because it's a collision, we're gonna use conservation of momentum. Momentum initial equals momentum final. Mm -hmm. And so before the collision, the only thing moving is M1. Yes. So it's going to be mass 1 times the initial speed of 1. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw this up here. This is that. Does that make sense why that is? Yes. Okay. The final yeah. speed of the slide is the initial speed of the collision. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and then in the final situation, both objects are moving. So you've got M1 times the final speed of one, plus M2 times the final speed of two. I'm looking at my work and I'm seeing. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because they're not stuck together and it's two objects and they're both moving. Mm -hmm. Now here's the problem, you've got one equation now with two unknowns. Mm -hmm. So we can't solve this without another equation. So what's the other equation we need? Um, I did, I'm sorry, I'm like lost in my work. Um, it's the, it's, um, one half mv squared plus one half mv squared. I'm kind of like, I don't, I can't yeah. follow my work. Okay, so you can legally, it's correct to use conservation of kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. However, that's the hard way. Okay. It's, it's legal to do it that way, but it's just the hard way. Mm -hmm. Use the other one that's on the equation sheet um, Darius, you don't have to have an equation sheet on you, do you? 
Okay. Let's see. Uh, Jesse, if you can pull up the equation sheet. Okay. I'm looking for two here. Okay, Let's I got see. it. Uh, it's there. It is conservation of kinetic energy near the bottom of the front of the front page. On the yes. Side, you can mm -hmm. use kinetic energy initial equals kinetic energy final, or mm -hmm. then it gives you this nice little equation and it says for one d collisions. Okay. Which is exactly what this is. So that, that second little equation, that's the one you want to use. It will make your life easier. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm hmm And what does it mean by 1D? Well, it's one dimension. Yeah, it means one. So it means, what that means is this one, M1, is traveling this way, and M2, after the collision, is going to be traveling this way. Both objects are going in one dimension. No, nothing's going up and down or anything like that. It's just straight. It's one dimension. Okay? Does that make sense what, what that means? Yes. Okay. So our second equation becomes this one. And it's just, just like it says. V1 initial minus V2 initial equals negative V1 final minus V2 final. And this one is zero because it was sitting there to start with. And this one is plugged in there also. So now you've got two equations and two unknowns. And now you can solve this. Okay. Uh, the algebra is a bit of, of a pain in the neck, but it's not too bad. But it is two equations and two unknowns. Okay. Okay. Do you know how to go through the process of two equations and two unknowns? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does that help? Does that set you up on that problem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm just going to kind of keep, keep working between the three of y'all. Uh, Darius, do you have, any, have you worked up a question yet? You don't have to if you don't want to. I'm just asking. I was just trying to follow. You're good. Okay. Chelsea, you worked up another question yet? Um, I'm good right now. Okay. Jess, we're uh, back to you. Do you, want, do you want to work on this for a minute, or do you want to ask me another question? Uh, right, may I ask you another question? Okay, go for it. Um... So then chapter seven, uh -huh. um, it's number, who's my, number, yeah, number four. Okay, give me a minute to get there. <clears throat> oh, okay, so now we're on chapter seven, number four, and we're looking at the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what's your question with this one? Um, I got part A. I did not get part B. Okay. Well, I, I just, I didn't even attempt part B. I didn't really understand what to do. Right. Okay. So let me read the question. A uh, roller coaster has a mass of blah, blah, blah. And then uh, it says, if the vehicle has a speed of 21 meters per second at the bottom of the hill, point A, what is the force of the track on the vehicle at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it says in Newton, so those are the units that it's looking for. Um, what is the force that's pushing on the car? What is that called at point A? So I'm still, I'm still working on part A. I know you've already got it, but I'm just kind of talking you through it because it'll help part B make sense. What's that force called that's pushing on the car? Gravity. Say it again. Gravity. Not quite. Gravity's pulling the car down. What's pushing the car up? Normal? Yes. It's the normal force. That's what's pushing the car up. So that's what part A is asking for. 
what's the normal force? Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? And you already did it, so I presume it makes sense. Uh, yeah. But with that in mind, there's two forces on the car in both of these situations, in both situation A and situation B, and it's gravity pulling down, normal force pushing it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that because the car is moving in a circle, it results in acceleration, centripetal acceleration towards the center mm -hmm. of the circle. So mm -hmm. let me draw uh, the part B up here. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this railroad track here, or roller coaster track. Okay. Part B, there's this car, railroad car with people in it. They always hold their arms up. Why? I don't know why. They just do. And <clears throat> the question is, what's the maximum speed that the vehicle can have at point B in order for gravity to hold it on the track? Okay, so the question... What would happen if this car moved too fast? Like say you're trucking along here at, I don't know, a thousand miles an hour. What happens when you get to the top of this? Oh, you go. You're gonna launch off this thing, right? Yeah. It's, it becomes a ramp at that speed. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And so the question is asking, what's the fastest you can possibly go and not fly off? Okay. That's what the question is asking. Of course, too slow, well, it'll just be a boring roller coaster ride. It'll mm -hmm. work. It's just boring. So it wants to know the exact number where if you went any faster, you'd launch. And of course, then people would die, and that's not good. But any slower, it would be boring. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> here's the way you answer that question. Let's identify the forces on this roller coaster. What are the forces on it? We've already talked about both of them. Normal, Normal and gravity, right? Yeah. yeah. I think all three of you all said it at the same time. Okay, so uh, normal force is pushing it up, and gravity is pulling it down. And if I was a good artist, those would both be up and down. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's add up the forces with Newton's second law. Some of the forces equals ma. So our two forces are normal force, and that's going up so it's positive, and gravity, so that's negative, meaning because it's going down, okay? And this equals ma. Now here's my question for you. Is this car accelerating? It's moving at a constant speed. No. That's a trick question. Isn't acceleration zero if it's constant? Acceleration is change in velocity <clears throat> over time. So if it was going in a straight line and it had constant speed, then yes, you would be correct. Okay. The acceleration was zero because the speed didn't change. Mm -hmm. But notice it's a curve. Mm -hmm. So its speed is not changing, but its direction is changing. Because it's going okay. in a circle, so, right? Yeah. So what that means is, even though the speed isn't changing, the direction is, which means it does have a change in velocity because it, it, it points in different directions. And one minute it's going this way, then straight, then down, right? It's, its direction is changing. So it does have acceleration. Mm -hmm. And that's called centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle. So I'm going to write a C there for centripetal acceleration. And we have an equation for that one. Do you have it memorized yet? Yeah, it's V squared 
times m over r. B no. squared over r. Yeah, v squared over r. And that's it, that's centripetal acceleration. So now we can write this out. Normal force minus force of gravity equals mass times v squared over r. So we're almost done with this problem here. Oh wait, one more piece, two more pieces. <clears throat> Which direction is the centripetal force? Um, what does the word centripetal mean? Center. Towards the center, exactly. So from the car, which way is center? Down, right? Because the center of the circle is over here, right? So from here to here is down. Does that make sense? So this centripetal acceleration it's negative. is negative because it's down. Now here's the other, this is the giant kicker to this problem, okay? If you went too fast over this thing, you would launch off, right? You'd be flying through the air. If you're flying through the air, what's the normal force on you? Nothing. Because <laughs> you're not touching anything, right? You gotta be on the surface for the surface to push back. Well, at that maximum speed, that's the first instant that the normal force is faster. I'm sorry, that the normal force is zero. So you're going through there just fast enough that your wheels aren't quite touching it. Oh, okay, yeah. They're, I mean, it's like you're, you're being picked up, but you haven't left the surface yet. The, 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 you're being picked up so the normal force isn't pushing back. Wouldn't the back wheels be on it, though? But I'm confused. Right at the maximum speed. Now, of course, if you go any faster than this, you're, you're flying, okay? Mm -hmm. But right at the maximum speed, there is no, no, no normal force. Anything less than that speed, and there will be a number for a normal force. But at the max speed, the normal force is zero. And that's the giant trick to this question. And okay. if you spent, if, if this is what I did when I was a kid, I'm sure y'all did this too. I had, I, I mean, I just, I loved to fly on my bicycle. I don't know what it was, but I, I'd just dig a pile of dirt and make myself a nice ramp, and I'd go barreling down the hill, and I'd try to fly every time I could off that hill. And I just, I just know from experience, right, if you go too slow, it's just the most boring ramp you ever did. You, you just don't go anywhere. You still feel lighter. The ground's not pushing back as much, but you just don't launch off. But if you get going fast enough, then you'll fly off the thing. And there's just a there's just a certain speed in there, a magic speed that works, where you actually launch off the thing. Okay. Does that kind of help? Mm -hmm. And so by setting this part right here equal to zero, and this part is equal here, that is that magic number. That's that max that maximum possible speed, where the normal force is just zero, and you're, but you're not quite launching off yet. Anything greater than that, and you will be launching off. Okay. So you set this equal to zero, and now you can just solve it for b. Okay, so do you see the two tricks? n is zero, and that's negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that help with that problem? Yeah, that helps. Those are, those are definitely the two tricks to that problem. A minute ago, Darius and Chelsea declined to have any more questions. Do y'all have any questions yet? Okay, so why is n zero again? Okay, it's really hard to describe, but you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, when you're on the roller coaster and you're going over that bump, you just, it feels real lightweight for just a second. Yeah, Okay. and that's, that's the whole thrill of the roller coaster is just that, Ooh, I feel lighter for a second. You're like, woohoo, he makes put your arms up in the air, right? Uh, <clears throat> normal force is zero because you're at the maximum speed where 
gravity alone is supplying the centripetal force. The normal force is not pushing back at all. Okay. I'm not quite sure how to say it a different way. I'm trying to think of a, a different way to say it than what I've already said. If you go too fast, you'll fly. If you go too slow, the normal force will push on you. If you go at just the right speed, the normal force is zero. And this equation gives you just that right speed. <coughs> Y'all have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it always works, right? You don't have any questions while you're here, and then as soon as you go home and start working on your own, then you're like, oh, I've got 50 questions. Answer. Yeah, that's, that's the big, the big test, right? Does it give you the yeah. green check or not? Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, um, if no one has any other questions, uh -huh. um, number five on chapter seven. I okay. didn't really understand. Let me look at number five. Oh, okay, that's the next one. Objects with masses, and gives you two different masses, uh, are separated by a certain distance. And it asks for the gravitational force exerted by these objects. I'm On a so third object that's placed in between them. Okay. So is it like hanging? No. Or? Uh, let me draw it up on the board here. Okay, because I couldn't even visualize it. Yeah, it's hard to visualize. So you've got two objects. There's object number one, and another object over here. And they're, it's not like they're sitting on a table. They're not even on the planet. They're just off in space somewhere. Just two objects, and they're not very far from each other. I think, what did it say, 0.31 meters or something? Uh, it says 0.31, yeah. Okay, so they're just that far apart as just two objects. Now, the thing is, because they have mass, because they have mass, they are necessarily attracted to each other. This is just, it's just what, is what Newton figured out back in the day. Any two, mass, any two masses will be attracted. That's why we're pulled to planet Earth, because it's a mass and we're a mass, and we're attracted to it, okay? And so uh, these two masses are attracted to each other because they both have mass. And then you'd expect, well, what's the force of gravity on this one is caused by that one, but it doesn't ask that question. It says, okay, now that you've got this, there's these two masses, they're off in space, and they're just separated at a small distance. Let's put a third mass right smack in the middle. And it says, what's the force of gravity on this one caused by both of these? Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So which way is this one pulled by that one? Which, which way does M3 go when it's caused, if, if, we weren't, if M1 wasn't there, which way would M2 pull it? Right. Yeah, it's, it would pull it this way. So I'm going to call this uh, F23. M2 is causing it on M3. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But what's, what's M1 going to try to put, make it do? Go the opposite way. Yeah, it's going to try to pull it this way. So this is going to be F13. Mm -hmm. And those two forces are found from Newton's law of gravity, which is. <clears throat> Uh, the force of gravity, is, that's a horrible G, is equal to uh, capital G, the universal gravitational constant, times M1 times M2 divided by the distance between them squared. 
So for, for F13, we'd put M1 and M3. But what would the distance be? 0 0.31 squared? No, oh, would it half of that? Yeah, it's this okay. distance. Mm -hmm. So it would be uh, 0.31 over 2. Okay. So that would be the force 1, 3. Mm -hmm. And then you do the same thing for the other one. Mm -hmm. And then you subtract them. Make this one positive and this one negative. Okay. Or add them, one's positive and one's negative, which ends okay. up subtracting. And that'll be your net force. Okay. Now the part B is the trickier question. Okay, does that, does part A make sense? Yeah, part A makes sense. Okay. Darius, Chelsea, what do y'all think? Well, you haven't gotten there yet, have you? No. Okay. I'm just watching. Just that watching. Okay, it. fair enough. Part B, what it's asking is, okay, if you put it smack in the middle, there is a net force on it. You found it for part A. Mm -hmm. What it's asking is, which way do you scoot it so that the net force on it is zero? In other words, what are these two masses? Will you read them to me again? Mass one is 235 and mass two is 535. Okay, so which one is going to have the bigger force of gravity on it? Mass two. Yeah, this one is going to pull it harder than this one. I'm sorry. This one's going to pull it harder than this one, right? Mm -hmm. So this one's going to have to be scooted a little bit closer over here so that the force pulling it that way and the force pulling it this way equal each other. Let me draw it out. Oh, because it has to do, I mean, not to bring in work, but it has to do more work, essentially, right? Like, it would have to pull more. It's it would have to use more force. Or is, does that? Well, it's, it's more like this. The force of gravity is not only proportional to the masses, but it's inversely proportional to the distance squared. Mm -hmm. So if I make this farther away, that gravitational force will be weaker, but this one will be stronger. Okay. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> let me write this one up here. F G two three is going to be G M two M three divided by R squared. Now, for part A, this R was just that number, mm -hmm. and it's going to be the same for both of them. But for part B you're gonna scoot this one over here, and it's, it's not gonna be that anymore. So I'm gonna call this uh, R13 and R23, but we'll call this one X, but, oh, let's do it this way, 1, 3. What's this one gonna be? Two, three? Yeah, you're right, it is two, three. What is it in relation to this number? Isn't it uh, 0.31 minus R13? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you'll do is you'll put this in here, and you'll put this in here and set these two equations equal to each other because the force of gravity will be equal at that point and solve it for R13. Okay. It'll give you a quadratic equation. Chelsea, did that make sense? Mm hmm Okay. Ch 
Chelsea, are you glad to be done with champs now? Yes and no. Yeah. Yeah. That means I can keep all my focus on just this and not do that and chance for that. Was... Yeah, that's <laughs> having a split focus is hard. Yeah. I got a wrong. Uh oh. <sighs> Red X's blast those things. <laughs> um. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, you're off quite a bit. Um, okay, so on part A, so for part A, just what's that now? It was just the um, F, G, 1, 3. It was the first equation. Okay, so let me erase this. So you're going to do F, 2, 3 minus F, 1, 3, and this oh. is... 0.31 over 2. Don't forget that squared. I didn't subtract. Did you not I subtract him? Yeah. <laughs> yep, that'll get you. <laughs> oh my I'm going to punch it out while you're working on it here. Okay. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Is that right? Yes. Uh, what was your middle mass, your M3? Uh, 65 kilograms. I got I got the answer that WebAssign has. So these numbers work. Okay. 
Let's, uh, let, let's write it out a little bit here. I, I can have some more board space. Can I just erase some of this and draw it out? Oh. Did you see the mistake? I think I just subtracted wrong. <clears throat> M2 times M3 divided by R squared minus G times M1 times M3 over R squared. We can simplify that. They have three things in common. They all have an M3. They, both sides have an R and both sides have a G. So we're going to pull all three of those items out. So this will be G times M3 divided by R squared times M2 minus M1. That might make your algebra, your punching buttons a little bit easier. So when we write that out, it'll be 6.67 times 10 negative 11 times M3, which is 65, divided by uh, 0.31 over 2 squared times 535 minus 235. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that too sloppy? Can you read it's that? Not, so that in the parentheses, 535 minus 235, is that multiplied by just the numerator or yeah. the entire thing? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it would be in the numerator. Okay. Yeah. Um, Did you get a significantly smaller number this time? Yeah, I got 5.41. Does that sound remote for you? Yeah. Okay. 5.41. Yeah. Is it 10 to the negative something? Negative, what was it? Negative 5? Yeah. Yep. Why do I keep? Yeah, that's the right answer. Okay. Did it give you the green check? Yes, it did. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See where to go with part B? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see. 
So part B, I set them equal to each other. Yes. Why are they equal to each other? You're correct. Because the net force is zero? Yeah, the force pulling to the left and the force pulling to the right add up mm -hmm. zero. And since there's only two of them, they must be equal in amount, equal, mm -hmm. equal in magnitude to each other. So you have G, M1, M3 divided by R13 squared <clears throat> has to equal G times M2 times M3 over R23. Oops. 2, 3 squared. And that, this is the force on the left, and this is the force on the right. And they have to be equal to each other. Now, what we can do is we're going to say, instead of 2, 3, we're going to call it this. That distance up there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to call this 0 0.31 minus R13 and square the whole thing. And now, we're going to solve this miserable little equation for R13. Uh, let's do some cancellation first. G cancels out, this on both sides, and so does M3. Okay. And now after this, it's just brute force algebra. So uh, I'd send this R13 squared term upstairs on the right. And this piece down here, I'd send it upstairs on the left. Okay. And now this piece down here, this thing here, that's a foil. Uh -huh. Okay. So don't forget to foil that out. So after you send it upstairs, foil it out, and then start adding, combining like terms. Okay. And it'll give you a quadratic equation. So let's see. I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to erase the board and start it up at the top and kind of work through it. Okay. side, so it's going to be M1 is 0 0.31 minus R13 equals M2 R13 squared. See how I just sent this piece up here and this piece up there? Yeah, I'm right where you are right now. Okay, now we got to square this bad boy here, so that means foil. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be M1 times 0 0.31 squared Let me write it out. I'll do it up here. 0 0.31 minus R13 times 0 0.31 minus R13. So first, which is 0 0.31 squared, outside minus 0 0.31 times R13, <coughs> inside minus 0 0.31 times R13, and then last, plus R13 squared. Does that foil make sense? Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna put that whole foil thing right here. So this is gonna be M1 times each of those four terms. So I'm just gonna write out each one. So M1 times 0 .3, oops, 0 0.31 squared minus M1 times, and then these two pieces here, they can be they can be combined, right? Because it's the mm -hmm. same thing. So let me combine that here. This be 0 0.31 squared minus 0.62 R13 plus R13 squared. <clears throat> so this times that second term minus M1 times 0.62 times R13 plus 
m1 times r13 squared equals, and this is all the left side, now on the right side I still have m2 r13 squared. That is a lot. <laughs> now, remember, we're gonna, this is a FOIL problem. We gotta solve this for R13, which shows up three different places. And it's a, it's a quadratic equation, so we wanna make it look like, let me use a different color here. We wanna make it look like A times X squared plus B times X plus C equals zero. We wanna make this look like this. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do that? Okay. Um, the M2 is messing me up. Well, here's what you got to think about. M1 and M2, they're just numbers. Uh, this one's what was it, 235 and 535 or something like that? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So that's just a number. Oh, so you just um, subtract um, the M2 R13 squared from the M1 R13 squared yep. and equal it to zero. Yep, we're going to subtract this piece to the other side so we get a zero on the right, just like this. Okay. And then we're going to combine these two equations, these two pieces, because they both have an R13 squared. Mm -hmm. So when we rewrite this, we'll put the squared term first. So it's going to be M1 minus M2 times R13 squared. That's these two pieces. Mm -hmm. And now we'll do this piece next. So it's going to be minus M1 times 0.62 times R13, and then this is our la this is our C piece here, so this will be plus M1 times 0.31 squared equals zero. So this is your A, this, including the negative sign, is your B, and this is your C. Okay. And then if, once you have it set up like that, do you see why this is a subtraction sign over here? Mm-hmm. I did two steps at once. You subtract this to the other side, and then you pull the R13 squared out. Mm -hmm. Now the quadratic equation says if this is true, then x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So now you just plug all those A's and B's and C's in here and solve it for X, but in this case your X is your R13. Okay. start plugging those numbers in on my own here. M1 was the 235, is that right? M1, yes.
And only one can be right, right? That's correct. Correct. Okay, let's see. Got a negative this time, so. Hmm. Okay. I really hope I didn't make a mistake. Um, I got. Wait, I'm getting imaginary numbers from this, which is something wrong. I shouldn't get any imaginary numbers. Oh. Did you do 235 minus 535? No. How come? B squared should be negative. Oh, A and C are both positive. Oh, wait. Is that supposed to be? Yeah, A is negative because it's 235. Ah, that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Yeah, because I... You did the same thing. No, I, I did it. I just, okay. I hope it's right. Okay, so what's your, what are the two numbers you got? I got negative 0 0.609 and 0 0.12356. Or 0.12356? Yes. Yes, those are the same numbers I got. Okay. And obviously, negative is not the correct answer. Mm -hmm. So it's that one. Now, what is WebAssign asking for? It's asking for at what position can the 65 kilogram object be placed so as to create a net force of zero? And it's looking in, it's looking for the answer in meters from the 535 kilogram mass. And what did we figure out? This this is our R13, right? Mm -hmm. That's the distance from the 235 kilogram mass. So we just have to subtract that from 0 0.31? Yes. Okay. I got it. Good. Okay. Did all this make sense why it is the way it is? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank the you. Algebra is a bit tricky on that one. Yeah, I think the algebra was a lot more tricky than the actual. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Sounds good. Chelsea, you doing all right over there? Mm hmm. I'm just listening. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. You done for the day? Yeah, I think I'm done for the day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks, y'all. Thank you. Have a good Fourth uh, of July, and I'll we'll do this again on Friday. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sounds Thank good. You. See you then. Bye bye. Bye.